when you were with the um, Crawling King Saints as well, was it all covers or did you do some originals? Yes, no, all covers. I've never until I start until my my you know my current band. Mm. I never wrote a song. I did try years and years and years ago. I used to try, but as soon as I got them. I realised that somebody else had done them years ago, you know. Right. I wrote half of Robert Johnson's songs without realising it, right. rewrote them. Yeah. So I, I, I didn't have the creativity. I, even now I don't have it. I can write a good lyric. The best one I've written so far is called Pussyhound Blues, and it's a tribute to Muddy Waters. Right. And I've stolen Muddy's melody, and it's a song about... Um, how shall I put this? Uh, it's a song about um, uh, a man who... <sighs> Praise on on married women who can't persuade their husbands to uh, go the extra mile to make them happy. You know, you'll have to work out the rest <laughs> yourself. I've got a good imagination. <laughs> oh, um, Muddy's um, uh, son, by the way, who Big Bill Morganfield, who does a, a, a Muddy tribute. He's bloody good as well. We uh, DJ and I out of my band. We saw him last year. Well, he might record the song. Um, he certainly told me he liked it when I sent him the. Um, the, the uh, YouTube shot that someone made of us right. when we were doing that. We had Noor Ali on lead guitar because right. uh, we were supporting the Spiders, so we did a jam, you know. At what point did the Crawling King Snakes come to an end then? It was, um, <sighs> three or four months into um, 1965. Right. Um, I'm not entirely sure now why we did split up. We were, we were getting regular bookings and during our good years, um, months, <laughs> I ran um, a blues club at the at the Old Crown uh, in, in Digbeth, uh, upstairs. What I didn't know until earlier this year was Perry Foster had already done that in 1958. Even had I known about it, I would never have been old enough to go into pubs. I, I looked even younger than my years back then. You might find that hard to believe now, but I did then. Um, <laughs> And for several months we, we uh, ran that place, we, we went there every, uh, every Friday night and um, we, we had a very good crowd too, it's packed. Better crowds now even than I get at the cellar bar. Right. Um, but though I can't, oh yeah, I think I do remember why we split up. Um, Malcolm and Phil, lead guitar and the drummer, they were always really strongly into jazz and I th I wanted to do the old stuff and I think what we had were musical differences right. <laughs> as they later came to be um, to be called. After a, something like 40 years I, I regained contact with uh, Phil and Malcolm just right. last year. Uh, Phil has, uh, Malcolm has um, has played in fact with um, with his partner uh, John Hall at Blues Night just a few months ago and Phil has played also with um, with Malcolm at Blues Night earlier this year. A reformation on the card? They do actually... Oh, that'd be great. I think Malcolm's quite keen on Especially it. Especially if he could come up with a set from that period. No, well we could, but nobody mm. would be interested now. Honestly, no, no. no it, it, it honestly wouldn't mm. work. For start off, I, I couldn't manage the harmonica mm. uh, all night long, you know, playing yeah. solos all night long. I'm just not up to that right. anymore. I can still give you a good blast for about three minutes, but after that I'm done. <laughs> And um, DJ, the harmonica player in my band, Stripped Down Blues, he, he's a wonderful harmonica player. I wouldn't dream of sitting alongside him and tooting away. And I'm used now to having people to do all that stuff, you know. Um, in The Outsider, Colin Wilson is always quoting someone who says, um, as for living, we leave that to our servants. Well, I prefer to leave everything to the rest of the band and, and just sing now and again. <laughs> Because I think I need a re I need the rest at my age. I need the rest. Did you stay out of those scenes altogether? Not entirely. I loved some of it. Um, I quite liked the Doors, though. I always thought um, Jim Morrison was another popping jay like Mick. I had no time for him at all. But they were a damn good band. Um, and I loved the uh, the female singers in particular, like Joni Mitchell. Uh, this is in the seventies now. Mm. Um, when when I met Deb. Um, uh, and she moved in with me uh, early in 1972. She brought with her quite a collection of people like Joni Mitchell and um, Judy Sill. Mm -hmm. And um, any particular albums and tracks from Joni Mitchell? Oh yeah, my um, my old man. Um, that's from Blue, isn't it? Yeah, from Blue. That's right. That that's mm -hmm. always been one of Deb's favourites. Um, River on 
Yeah, the river's great. Uh, Raised on Robbery was one of my favourites. Yeah. Um, and Little Green, of course. And we didn't know, did we, when we heard Little Green, exactly what that song was no, about. No, tell me. <laughs> Don't you know? No. Well, she, um, Joni Mitchell found out just five years ago, was it, that, um, that the little girl that she gave up for adoption when she was a teenager, uh, whom Little Green is talking about, um, had her own daughter, and, and she made contact with her with her uh, with her mom and told Joni she was a grandmother you didn't know that, no, I didn't know that. Ah. well I hope I've got the facts right yeah <laughs> <laughs> check them by yeah. all means do you want to put allegedly <laughs> <laughs> it's a very very we'll, sad we'll song allegedly in <laughs> really sad right. song and partly I think because of Deb uh, I, I began to see far more in in female musicians and singers than I had before I love Wanda Jackson when she covered Elvis's Let's Have a Party. That was a belter back in the late 50s. And, of course, Tina, Turn T Tina Turner I used to love. But the white girl singers, I just used to dismiss them as Jennies and Jonies and Jillies. But um, I found that... Uh, I still think Joni Mitchell is um, a better songwriter than Bob Dylan. No. I really do. He moves me more, but there's something about Joni Mitchell that nobody else ever had. But there are others, you know, who are almost as good. When, when Bob Dylan first came along, I adored him. But I was the last to notice what a great writer he is. I didn't care about that. I heard him singing about the times are changing and Hollis Brown and things like that, you know. And I loved the sound of his voice. I loved his harmonica. On the back of his first LP, he was, it said, he's only a functional guitar player. And, and I listened to him doing Don't Think Twice, and I, this is functional for crying out loud? That isn't functional, that's bloody hard to do. Well, you're on an interesting path there. What Did you ever sort of get into the Davy Grahams and things like that? Oh, yes, I did. Yeah. Um, shame about him. Because he was, well, apparently, way ahead of everybody yes, else. Yes, was. Thing, wasn't it? All of those people, Bert Yanch yeah. and, um, and all those people that influenced Jack Blackman, uh, I adored them, and I loved the stuff that influenced them. Um, as, as indeed does Jack, uh, stuff from Blind Blake and Lonnie Johnson. By then, I, I pretty much resigned myself to the groove that I, that I happen to be in, and, and I stopped envying people who could do stuff I can't do, which is just as well. I mean, Worcester's full of them now. <laughs> well, I, I did join um, Finn Steele's band for a while. Do you remember Finn? No. He was, I, he, I might not have been around here, or I might not have known No, him. OK. Well, he, he was uh, part of... Um, Pete Unwin, uh, Pete oh, Unwin's right. mob, yeah. back then, and um, Pete did a very moving eulogy uh, at uh, Finn's funeral about seven or eight years ago. Right. Um, I, I didn't last very long. Um, a little later, a few years after that, I joined another rhythm and blues band who were doing Albert King and Albert Collins, people like that. Um, it didn't work. Really, when uh, when Rod Jones and I started Blues Nights at the Cellar Bar back in '04, we took it on from um, James Perry, James 1147. It was his idea, actually. Um, and in August, September '04, James said, I want to run a Blues Night. You find me the singers, and, um, and we'll do it. And Rod and I both thought it was a great idea, because James had let us play at, um, at his gigs on uh, First Tuesday, as they were called at the Cellar Bar. And I often wondered why, because we were, you know, grandfathers compared with the average age of, uh, of those people there. Um, and there were some great teenage performers there, you know. They were scarcely old enough to go into the cellar bar. They were really very good indeed. But for some reason, I think the kids just found a couple of grandparents rather cool, you know, that would sit there and do it. I think also blues and jazz seems to um, have more authenticity when it's older. I, if I see... Uh, Blues with two younger people do it. It kind of it, it kind of hasn't got that authentic feel, and a bit like even the old blues men were old anyway yeah. when, when they were doing it. It's funny so. you should say that. I've got respect I don't deserve because of my grey hairs. <laughs> I've heard, um, I've seen videos that I've done of gigs which people have said some very very kind things about, some very enthusiastic things. Then I've listened and watched the videos later, thinking. 
What the hell were they hearing? <laughs> but you were probably you, you're comparing it with masters and with a master's knowledge, I, su I suppose. I suppose so. Yeah, it, 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 there's always that, and you're always very self-critical. Like yeah, that. I've watched those blues videos because I've, I've had to go because you've probably filmed half of them anyway. Don't yes, you? he probably. Uh, but you know, and it does feel like it's got an authentic sound, and and I think what people get is once you once you've told the story and you're into it, you really get that you really love it. You're not just sort of. I don't know, like um, tribute karaoke or something, where they kind of just yeah. sing the notes, but they don't love it. Y no, I think two things um, influence amateur musicians such as I. One is um, uh, they they want to be on stage. It, it, it's the ego thing. Uh, I, I don't decry that. You, you, mm. you better have ego if you're yeah. going to be a performer, or you'll just sit there mumbling. You know, you might still perform nicely, but you've really got to try and entertain the crowd. You know, and reach out to them and. and uh, and do that. The other reason is money. Well, there's no money in blues, for Christ's sake. Unless you're having fun doing it, um, then there's no point in doing it. And, of course, although I, I understand that some um, colleagues in the trade um, are uh, a little... Sometimes they're a bit dismissive of all the freebies uh, that spring up, particularly when they are, shall we say, cloaked in, um, in the guise of charity mm. dues. Uh, you all know the, the, yeah, the suspects, so I won't go into any more of that. Um, but the, the great thing, I suppose, about being a free and easy performer, uh, don't care whether you get paid or not, which is just as well, because most of the times you don't, but you don't have to do it. Mm. See, now, one of the reasons that I left Crawling King Snakes, I've only just remembered, I began to get a bit tired of, uh, you know, we gig like every Friday, we'd gig at least once in the midweek somewhere else and, and we'd probably do a gig in the weekend as well Saturday something like that we uh, when when the Spencer Davis band left Birmingham and started working in London whenever they came back to Birmingham to play they would always ask for us to be their support band um, for the same reason that I would have asked us to be a support band if I'd have been Spencer Davis we were good enough but there was we were nowhere near as good as they were <laughs> <laughs> Some things never change, do they? <laughs> Spencer Davis did once say to me, he said, I wish I could play harmonica like you. Well, of course he could, but he was just being kind. But I was good enough to take the compliment, because yeah. I knew I was good. Um, Steve never said, I wish I could sing like you, and he never would have done. He left it. I left performing behind for over 30 years. For 30 years you left it behind? Mm, yeah. The only time I ever used to play would be when I was, I'd sit there in, in the living room waiting for Deb to get ready, and, and I had to do something. So I'd play my guitar. I, I still played it every day, mm. but it was more therapeutic. But Perry Foster accidentally brought me out of retirement. He gave me an open mic spot at the uh, Blues Festival that he ran in Gloucester. He ran the open uh, the open mic, and I played there a couple of times. And um, from there, I did something at Mars Bar one Sunday evening. I, I didn't tell Deb I was going to do it. Marsy would lend you a guitar, and I whispered, "I said, can I can I do something?" And he said, Are "You any good?" I said, yeah, <laughs> of course I wasn't. Um, and Deb was absolutely astonished when, when the old man walked up and she'd, she'd heard all my stories about the old days, whether she believed them or not, I don't know. She had no idea that, that I could do quite what I was able to do. You've never had any regrets, clearly, because you're doing it more and more now. No, right? I, I don't know why I didn't do it before. Um, Sounded like it was getting a bit of a treadmill. I couldn't say. Uh, it just seemed like the natural thing to do. Oh, of course. I hadn't. It, it was because Worcester was, was a, a musical town, even back when I came out of retirement back in the, uh, the early 90s, um, which my previous town, uh, Rugeley, where I lived, wasn't. And Birmingham had stopped being blues town, and, and I just couldn't get along with all that reggae and Irish stuff they were into.